Welcome everybody to the plant-based telehealth live Q and A, where we're here to help support you in your transition to a plant-based diet or any questions you might have. And today we want to welcome Dr. Jeff Pierce, who's our new addition to our team. Welcome, Dr. Pierce. Hi, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Great. Nice Excellent. To see you guys. <laughs> so, Dr. Pierce, could we really want to make sure everyone knows about you and what you enjoy and do? So, can you tell us a little bit about? Like your practice and specifically maybe some fun cases or something that you'd want to share with us especially maybe your interest sure um so yeah my name is jeff pierce i'm originally from texas and um have lived in california since i came here for residency training in family medicine back in 2004 um, and uh, my practice uh, has involved since then working uh, a lot internationally in Africa, Latin America, a little bit in Asia, um, and uh, I've had a focus on uh, uh, infectious disease care, um, and then also in the care of uh, pregnant women, and that's probably been my uh, greatest focus um, is uh, I'm, I'm working in the obstetrics and gynecology department at, uh, at a hospital, and um, that's where I'm doing most of my uh, care, and um, as far as lifestyle medicine goes, uh, help, uh, using diet and other lifestyle modalities to um, help people prevent, treat, and reverse chronic illnesses, that goes uh, from you know uh, all stages of the, of the life, um, uh, from birth to, to death, and um, with, with a special focus on obstetrical care. Mm. So could you tell us, is there anything special that we have to be, like for example, how do you approach someone who is pregnant and, you know, how, how do you get them started on this plant-based diet and any special um, considerations for someone who's pregnant? Sure. So it, uh, of course, will depend on where the person is starting. And um, for some, for some women coming in, they're already eating great and, you know, they're, they're plant-based or vegan and they just want to know, Hey, what sub supplements should I be paying attention to? And do I need to in increase my iron or my, protein and things like that. Most, to, to be honest, in my current practice in the in a inner city uh, county um, clinic and county hospital, um, most patients aren't coming from that standpoint. They are coming from, hey, I, I'm in my first trimester and you're just telling me that I have a new diagnosis of totally uncontrolled diabetes that I didn't know about. And I'm you know, 100 pounds overweight maybe, and I have high blood pressure and risk factors for heart disease. And, you know, just, I guess, give me the, give me the insulin and give me the um, medication stock, uh, I guess, if I have to. And, and so we're starting at a very different uh, place for them. Um, mm. And uh, uh, certainly it's uh, interesting lessons from both groups of those patients. Um, uh, but it, you asked, you know, are there certain things that uh, women should be paying attention to? And I think uh, as, uh, um, uh, as I was uh, learning from uh, uh, a webinar with Dr. Clapper and Brenda Davis and, and others recently, um, there are, uh, thankfully, in a, it, for a woman eating a, a plant-based diet, by and large, you're going to have your base is covered. And there's some things that you have to pay particular uh, attention to. And we can go into that in more detail um, uh, as the webinar progresses, perhaps. But things like making sure that you're getting your folate and uh, B12 and your iron. And uh, uh, you need some more protein, but you'll get that from eating your legumes and your uh, whole grains and uh, nuts and seeds and healthy fats and things like uh, omega-3s and all that stuff all comes in. A little bit of supplementation as well as eating a a broad diet. Cool. Dr. K, Dr. Miller, do you have any questions for Dr. Pierce? I do, actually, Dr. Pierce. I would like to know how you went whole food plant based. What motivated you to go that direction? Sure. So um, I uh, born and raised in Texas, uh, where uh, you might have heard uh, we have lots of meat over there, and uh, uh, also came coming from a bicultural family. Uh, uh, Hispanic, Latino on my mom's side. Hi, mom. I know you're supposed to say hi to mom whenever you're on uh, television. It's required. Um, and so uh, you know, from multiple directions, lots of uh, pressure for uh, eating meat um, and uh, uh, drinking dairy. And, and, and I'm very lucky. I had a very 
healthy and, and lucky upbringing by and large. And I owe my, I owe, you know, my life to my family. And I'm thankful for it. Um, but it was in college that I saw my uh, first documentary on um, uh, the modern meat uh, sort of industry. Um, and that was in 2000. And so I uh, quit eating meat at that point um, as I was finishing college, going into med school. Was vegetarian for 20 years, uh, have been vegetarian for 20 years, but um, in the last uh, eight years or so, uh, when I met my wife, who did a good job of showing me how to not be a junk food vegetarian and to uh, eat better, um, uh, plus showing me how we can grow our own food and eat really healthily um, from the vegetables and fruits that we plant in our own garden, um, uh, as well as stumbling initially into the literature from Michael Greger at nutritionfacts.org, um, the good folks at uh, Physicians Committee with Neil Barnard, Dr. Dougal, et cetera, um, I learned that uh, there is, there's, a, there's a difference between veg being vegetarian and eating a very healthy whole food plant-based diet um, for prevention, for treatment. Um, I have noticed that my hand arthritis that I would, that would come and go has gone away. My um, seasonal allergies that they say everyone in Northern California just has to deal with every uh, winter and spring have pretty much gone away. Um, and it was subtle uh, and I was just thinking back to it. I was like, wow, I, I haven't taken pills for allergy for years. That's awesome. So we'll have to have your wife on next time. To, she's the yeah. one who made the change. <laughs> and she'll, she'll keep me straight and make sure that everything I'm saying is, awesome. is true. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Dr. Pierce, you're, you're licensed in California, correct? I am. I'm licensed in California since all my training and work has been here. Um, I did college and med school in Texas, but you, you're not licensed in med school. Um, but I am uh, in uh, in the process of uh, the application process for getting uh, medical licensing in, in Texas, and that should hopefully be coming through pretty soon. Excellent, excellent. And then as far as um, any other suggestions, there's a few questions. Are you okay with me? Oh, you're starting Monday, first of all. You have appointments. <laughs> um, we're starting on Monday, so you guys can book cool. out the, the new appointments. Just go to the website, the plantbasedtelehealth.com website where you can click in uh, request an appointment with Dr. Pierce or any of us um, should you uh, like to do that. And so I would suggest there's some questions here if you're cool with. I have one more question for Dr. Oh, Pierce. go for it, Chris. I want to know um, why you're excited to work with plant-based telehealth. Why, why does, should everybody know that you're excited to work with plant-based telehealth? That's a great question. So um, even being, uh, I guess, eating a vegetarian diet for the last 20 years, I uh, when it came to patient care, I kept that pretty much to myself, you know, I think. And in medical training, by and large, we're told, you know, politics, religion, um, personal habits like this, you're, you're sort of encouraged to keep it to, to yourself and uh, not um, uh, maybe make a patient feel awkward by sitting down and talking to them about your beliefs on, you know, who's coming up for president and stuff like that. And so uh, I have that as a very personal thing. I kept it to myself. But um, after uh, learning more in the last, really just uh, in the last <laughs> um, couple of uh, years, of just how powerful this can be, I felt like I couldn't not share this with my, pa my patients, right? This is, you know, I, I'm almost a form of medical malpractice with the knowledge that I have to not talk about it. And, um, and so, you know, what a way to... Um, be able to uh, day in and day out share such a powerful modality um, with my patients in a group like plant-based telehealth instead of where I'm say in a regular clinic where I have to do these 10 things in a uh, cover these 10 topics in a 15-minute uh, appointment um, uh, where I'm rushing through to make sure that the baby's heart rate is good and that you've gotten your ultrasound and you've gotten your last um, and you have such a narrow amount of time to talk about, hey, well, let's try to get to the root of your diabetes and your um, uh, obesity and your hypertension. And, and you kind of have five minutes to do that if you're going to um, move on to the next patient. And so with plant-based telehealth, this is our chance to do that. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful explanation. That's fantastic. And um, speaking of, of sharing this information, that's the joy of doing something like this. So we're actually able to 
share the power of nutrition and lifestyle intervention um, with a, a broader audience. And um, I do know we have some questions. And by the way, looks like someone said, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but it says, love the Gaiabera, Dr. Pierce. <laughs> is that the plant or what you're wearing or the, what is that? Right. The, the shirt is a, a, a Guayabera and um, uh, sometimes people refer to it as the Mexican wedding shirt. Um, uh, they, uh, <laughs> okay. But you see it all throughout Latin America and even uh, the Philippines and, uh, and stuff like oh, that. Oh, yes, definitely in the Philippines. So essentially, so. you're getting married to us today. Oh, I, I guess so. <laughs> it's like we're, we, it's we, a public we announcement. In on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, excellent. So here's a before go ahead, Dutch Yes. yes uh, before we uh, uh, move into the questions here, I just want to say one how wonderful it is to have another experienced professional uh, join our team here and it's certainly going to increase our <clears throat> our breadth and our depth. And uh, so I did uh, six months of obstetrics at University of California at, at Moffitt Hospital. And I know the world that uh, Dr. Pierce is coming from and bringing to us. And so if you are a couple or a young woman who's either thinking of getting pregnant, is newly pregnant, has any questions uh, about your, your pregnancy as you go through this, uh, he's just a jewel of a resource. And don't, don't hesitate to make an appointment and at least uh, lay out your questions and uh, the things you're dealing with, supplements, et cetera, at least a, a one-time visit, if not having him you know, kind of look over you during your pregnancy. But uh, with this kind of obstetric experience, it's just a, it's a gift to our practice, but uh, to everybody uh, might be in that uh, market to uh, to get this information. It's great to have them on board. Yes, I think that's fabulous. You're exactly right. We we all echo the sentiments. I was telling him how excited it was to share <laughs> Dr. Pierce with the, the audience today. Is it's, it's really amazing. Um, so, but I will go to the next question now. So, um, there was a question, and you know, whoever likes to take it, should young women supplement folate? It's a one that comes up often. Any suggestions, thoughts? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to start with it. Um, I mean, I think, so in, folate is a critical um, nutrient for, micronutrient for um, pregnancy, uh, particularly in the formation of the neural tube of the, the, the very early um, nervous system in the first uh, trimester. And um, this is going on sometimes before you realize that you're pregnant. Um, uh, it is not an uncommon thing for a, a woman to come to my initial obstetrical uh, visit where she's like, you know, I think I'm six weeks along and she's actually 20 weeks or 16 weeks, et cetera. So being on, um, being on folate is very uh, helpful if you are uh, in the age range where you could get pregnant, even if you're not planning uh, actively on getting pregnant, because I would say the majority of my patients, when I ask them, like, oh, you know, what was going on? You, were you planning this? Is this a surprise? How do you feel about it? And they're like, oh, it was a surprise, but we're happy with it, which is the most common response. And so being on folate means that you are, um, that you are going to be prepared. Now, for some women, that's being on a multivitamin, um, getting that uh, four, 400 micrograms a day um, for a healthy, um, for a very uh, healthy eating, whole food plant-based person. You know, uh, folate comes from uh, foliage, um, and so eating lots of greens, uh, which people eat in whole food, plant-based diet do, um, you will be getting lots of uh, folate. But particularly if you're thinking about getting pregnant, if you're um, in early pregnancy, add that supplement as part of a prenatal vitamin. Excellent. And uh, another question here, what dose of B12 do you suggest? Do you recommend a daily or less frequently? I've seen Dr. Greger recently change his suggested amount and Dr. McDougall recommends less than others I've seen. Um, um, looks like Dr. Clapper stepped off for a bit. So Dr. Pierce, Dr. Miller, any suggestions sure. on that? I think it's on from the pregnancy side. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is an interesting one where um, you will see this, some disagreement among um, big names in the plant-based community. And you, uh, the, participant mentioned a couple who feel differently about it. Um, so yes, B12 is, is very important in, in pregnancy and uh, you will, so you'll see the recommendation that the B12 that's in your prenatal vitamin, you're getting that every day. And uh, we need really uh, just a few micrograms per day and that's gonna be enough. 
Other people say, well, maybe it's not absorbed so well when you're getting it as part of a multivitamin, add an additional uh, B12 supplement. That could be uh, 50 micrograms a day. It could be 1,000 micrograms twice a week. Um, in addition to the multivitamin, you could be adding two, uh, you know, a lunch and a dinner uh, worth of vitamin B12 supplemented foods, which could be, um, you know, uh, cereals or uh, nutritional yeast um, and things like that. And so I don't think the science is to the point to where we can say definitively, this is what pregnant women should do when it comes to B12, but there are a range of options that will probably work for you. I don't know what the rest of you guys have to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree. So I usually test the levels and see where they're at. And then we'll, we'll make some suggestions from there because sometimes some people are symptomatic with even the normal range, you get them a little higher, they feel better, um, and including tingling nerve, you know, kind of the discomfort that they may have. And maybe their methylonic acid is elevated, which is another indicator of where you don't have quite enough B12. But there's several indicators I would say test and don't guess, but, and Dr. Miller, Dr. K, you have any suggestions on that? I test as well now. Um, and a study came out just in the past year, which is why I think you're seeing a lot of people go with lower doses that where people who had high, highest levels of B12 were having higher all cause mortality. And so we have all backed down. We used to think, oh, you just pee out extra B12. It's not a big deal, but that's not true actually anymore. So now I think you'll see everyone is starting to back down their numbers. But the other thing is if it's too low, people for all sorts of reasons don't absorb it very well anymore. So it's, it is individual. And so I also test in some people 300 is enough. Some people, they don't need very much at all. They can do it through foods. Other people are on a thousand micrograms a day and they're barely getting right where we need them to be. So I actually do monitor that now. So, um, but in general, I tell people to start with about 500 micrograms a day of B12 um, and, and kind of go from there then follow levels. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I certainly agree with Dr. Miller. And the only thing I would add is that uh, the majority of folks, the question is what, what, what form of, uh, of B12 uh, is, uh, should be used. And it's the issue of the cyanocobalamin versus methylcobalamin. And uh, it turns out the cyanocobalamin is cheaper and more stable, and it works for the vast majority of folks. Uh, and uh, so I have no problem with people taking that. Uh, I don't think the cyanide is, is a significant amount. But when you get your B12 measured, you should also get your uh, level measured of uh, uh, substance called homocysteine and uh, homocysteine uh, is not friendly to your artery walls and if it's high even though your b12 levels are normal you may be someone who needs a methylated form of your b12 and your folate and uh, so if your uh, your homocysteine is stubbornly high uh, you know 14 15 16 or higher uh, then you uh, probably should not only be on methylcobalamin but also uh, methylfolate as well um, as uh, Dr. Pierce said, uh, folic acid, folate really comes from foliage, and, and it's really true. And the vast majority of uh, vegans and plant-based folks I've seen who really do eat those big plates of greens like we're all told to do, their folate levels are off the chart when you measure it. It really does get into your blood. It does the trick there. Uh, but if you're not eating that and your folate level is low uh, and your homocysteine level is, uh, is high, uh, you might want to get a, a supplement that has methylcobalamin and methylfolate in it, but eat more greens anyway. Excellent advice. And so another question here is I'm having a hard time making 100% commitment was um, brought up eat, at eating meat at every dinner table. Any suggestions on someone struggling with commitments? Anybody? Chris? <clears throat> So I was just starting to form a plan in my head, but basically it's different for every person. So I would, I would ask you, you know, what your goals are and what you want to, what you want to accomplish. And um, I would uh, probably recommend something like watching some of the documentaries, maybe get some inspiration um, and start getting the information on what a whole food plant-based diet really does and why you want to eat less meat, why it matters, <clears throat> excuse me why it matters for your body, for your health, um, about the eating more meat. And when you review about the increased risk of cancer, the increased risk of, of heart disease, increased risk of all-cause mortality, the increased risk of diabetes, obesity, all of these things, inflammation, autoimmune sy symptoms, all of this is significantly increased with increased meat. And so when you start to review that, 
that helps. That information is going to help. It's not enough to get you over the hump, but it's going to help. So keeping that in your mind and writing out a plan for your, or writing out your why, why does it really matter? Why do you care whether you have heart disease or not? Why do you really care ultimately? And writing that down, looking at it, thinking about it, uh, maybe meditating on it, having it there. And then from there, there's all sorts of different ways we could approach it. So, um, and that's where you want to work with maybe one of us or someone else, but um, it, there's things like small steps, baby steps. So starting small, maybe starting one meal a day, maybe just working on breakfast, breakfast alone, building a breakfast that has no animal products and substituting, make sure it's nice and substantial so you don't miss it and doing that for a couple of weeks and just that alone. Um, you could also start with a great meat reduction instead of a big piece, you're doing a little piece and building, a, adding the plants in. So just start adding in. So there's a lot of fun ways you can do it. Make it fun, make it not about depriving, oh, you can't have meat anymore. You can have meat, you're choosing not to. You're choosing it for yourself, for your health, maybe for the animals, think about them, maybe for the environment, think about that. So um, so yeah, we'd be happy to help you build a plan or you know, if you're working with someone, but um, we can help, you, you can get there. You just have to figure out a way that works for you, I would say, so. Any other thoughts, suggestions on commitment? Yeah, if you haven't seen a film called Cowspiracy, another one called What the Health, see those two films and uh, see if that doesn't uh, change your opinion of, of a meat-based diet for all sorts of reasons. Highly recommend it. Excellent. Dr. Pierce, any other suggestions? You're good. All right. Um, the only thing I'd say is uh, when you're looking at commitment is what keeps tripping you up. So obviously you have the desire to do so, um, but I would, I would sit down and analyze what are the circumstances that are tripping you up? Is it family members? Is it not being prepared? Is it fatigue? Is it, you know, all these different things. And then try to come up with solutions in small steps, like Chris was saying, that will help you overcome those things that trip you up. So if it's stuff that's in the house, get it out of the house. <laughs> you know, if it's a family member bringing you home something, have a conversation. So there's just all these different things. If there's, um, you get hungry when you're traveling home from work, bring healthy snacks with you. So there's just find where that tripping point is and then that'll allow you to be prepared for it and you're more likely to be successful when you're prepared. Um, having come out of the military background, preparation is key um, when you're confronted with something. So absolutely practice it in your mind, what's gonna get you over the hump. So um, some additional questions, here's a good one. Um, looks like we have a few <clears throat> actually about uh, hormones. Um, one in particular, how do you go about healing adrenal fatigue and balance hormones postpartum? So I guess mostly like you get all these things occurring after having a baby. Any suggestions or things that people should be doing after pregnancy to promote their health? I can speak generally. I guess I don't, I haven't followed uh, evidence-based guidelines for this, but speaking generally, you know, we encourage, um, many of the uh, lifestyle habits that are um, the pillars of lifestyle medicine, teaching and movement, right? So uh, eating a very healthful diet full of veg fruits and vegetables and, and healthy carbohydrates and stuff like that has been shown to help mood in general. And I think I've seen something uh, specifically when it comes to postpartum depression. Um, and so uh, the foods we eat affects uh, our mood and our return to, to balance because we know that um, uh, hormonal shifts equal mood shifts and, and postpartum depression, is, for example, is a very uh, important consequence of that. Um, exercise, um, uh, and this in part comes from not just uh, focusing on just on your baby, which is often the core desire of many uh, moms, but uh, to be able to to focus on yourself. So are you getting enough exercise? That might mean um, going out for a walk in your, uh, in your stroller with a nice wheel that allows you to, uh, you know, walk at a good clip and, um, and help in that way. And uh, when you're outside walking, uh, you're getting some sunshine uh, for yourself, uh, you know, um, covering your brand new baby uh, from the sun is a good idea, but um, uh, uh, you're getting the vitamin D and the mental health uh, benefits that come with that um, related to a total body balance. Working on sleep, which is, uh, you know, if you have not uh, done it yourself, uh, you, you know uh, someone who has uh, uh, faced the challenge of getting good sleep when they're a new mother. Um, and 
there's some ways to tackle that. Um, and uh, making sure that you have good uh, connection with uh, other people who are supporting you, uh, you know, the, the proverbial village that you're working with to help support you through the difficult nights and the difficult uh, days and, and all of that. Excellent. Anybody else? Other? All right, we'll go on to the next one. Um, regarding calcium, my kids aged 8 and 11 do not drink fortified drinks, and despite getting daily greens, I fear it's not nearly enough to meet their growing body needs. What type of supplements do you recommend, preferably in powder form, so I can add them to our homemade soy milk and smoothies? Do you have any suggestions on the kids and calcium needs and how to move that needle forward? Or I can, all right. So um, honestly, Kip, um, <laughs> you just, what you wanna do is really pay attention to your children and their growth. Um, are they staying on the same growth chart pattern or like, are they falling off? Um, that would be one thing. Do they have energy? Are they really running around like crazy mad people with tons of energy like most kids do? You know, make sure you're getting enough calories um, because if they're getting their greens, I mean, honestly, and you're getting some wide variety of foods, so they should, they should be fine. Um, but I would definitely look at their vitamin D levels and make sure those are appropriate. Um, have your doctor check those. And of course their B12. Um, but as long as they're getting all the, the greens and the beans and all these lovely foods, they should be good to go and just in quantity sufficient to sustain a growth of a child. But any other suggestions or thoughts there? Agree. Okay. And, uh, I would just yes, recommend if you're, if you're raising a, a child here, um, I, as part of uh, our master class, uh, we interviewed uh, two authors of just a, a wonderful new book. Uh, let me just write it here. Uh, and the book is called Nourish um, by Brenda Davis and Reshma Shah. And uh, they go through all the stages of life. And, they, they, and Dr. Shah is a vegan pediatrician. And she really has a wonderful chapter on, on raising kids and getting enough calcium and all that in there. So, uh, uh, so I highly recommend that you get that book. And they have very good advice. But it's, it's, it's pretty okay. easy to, uh, uh, to get enough calcium into your child. We'll find ways to get greens into them. But yes, there are liquid uh, calcium uh, substance, uh, 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 liquid uh, calcium supplements that you can use uh, to put into a smoothie and just you know, look for them on uh, online. You, you'll find them, just Google liquid calcium supplements. Okay, excellent. And so that was nourished by Dr. Um, Reshma Davis. Shaw and Brenda Davis. Fantastic. Yeah, All right. Um, Oh, he says, Kip says he's got the book. So excellent. Kip's one of the mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. He's on it. Kip has a lot of books, I have a feeling. All right. Um, and then someone did ask if we accept TRICARE. Um, they said, I need a plant-based doctor. We don't accept insurance. Um, if you go to plantbasedtelehealth.com, if you look under information, it discusses pricing. But we can provide what we call a super bill or receipt for a visit. And then you can submit it yourself to your insurance company and hopefully you can get um, some reimbursement. I've had patients get zero to hundred percent. So there's no really rhyme or reason why one and not the other, but that is certainly an available service should you choose to come see us. Um, and I think we're closing in here, but um, you guys have time for a question or two more. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Um, Cause there's this one question. We do see this kind of often. Um, this patient says I'm 44 and my hair has been very thin since becoming vegetarian at 20. Um, I take two tablets of ferrous gluconate every other day. Can I bump that up daily and still avoid constipation? <clears throat> what else should I look at? I miss the volume and it won't grow past my shoulders because it breaks off so regularly. Thanks. Any suggestions on the hair loss that sometimes can occur when transitioning to a different diet? Yeah, there's a lot of reasons for hair loss, actually. So um, I work with a lot of patients. I'm sure we all do see patients that have hair loss and um, iron insufficiency is one reason. So you want to, I'm assuming that you're iron deficient, that you're replacing your iron because otherwise you usually don't want to be in an iron supplement, but you most likely are. So um, you, I would make sure there's other, that you're, see what your iron levels are before you think about increasing the iron. You don't want to over treat iron. You want to just be in the normal range. So that's more important because iron is actually pro-oxidant. And so um, that's one thing I would check your levels and make sure. And um, it's good that you're doing it every other day though. I agree with that plan. Um, so 
that's that's that. But there's so many other reasons for hair loss. So inflammation ca can cause that. So people undergoing autoimmunity or any other chronic inflammatory state might see hair loss. Different medications can cause it. Stress is a huge role. It plays a huge role in hair loss. So um, what's going on in your life right now? That's a thought. Um, also other nutrients. So zinc plays a role in iron. Um, B7, I believe it is. Um, biotin plays a role in iron. And so basically taking a look at your diet and how well you're absorbing it. So we can check levels and we can make help make sure that um, other causes of it besides just iron deficiency. And there's actually a few other things that I'm not that I'm coming to mind. Maybe someone else will think it right now, but there's a, a differential for it that we can maybe help you with or um, yeah, so we see people with hair loss and often it changes with the diet and then it changes back. And so, but if this is going on for 20 years and now you're noticing it, then maybe you do want someone to kind of check your levels. I'll help you with that a little bit. Okay, so any other uh, thoughts? Yes, that was really well answered. Uh, the only thing I would add, uh, you need a sufficient omega-3 fats for nice skin oils uh, to make sure your hair quality is, is, is healthy. So uh, eat the, the couple tablespoons of ground flax and chia seeds every day. Um, but also, as uh, Dr. Miller was hinting at, uh, these uh, iron tablets, they're not candy pills. And, and for iron deficiency to be a cause of hair loss, you're, you're dealing with a pretty significant iron deficiency in my, uh, in my experience. Um, but uh, if, it's, uh, if you're not at, the, at that level of iron deficiency, uh, it's not a matter of taking more iron tablets to get your hair to grow. And there certainly is such a thing as iron overload. It can really damage your liver, your bone marrow, et cetera. Uh, it, it can be pretty toxic stuff there. So as Dr. Miller said, uh, get your iron levels checked. And if they're already uh, in the attic, they're really high. Uh, you know, don't, be, don't be taking more iron pills just to make your hair grow. Uh, a, a word to the wise there. Work with your doctor on that one. Yeah, Very good. You're a bunch of know how to do that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and uh, yeah, she said her ferritin had been low in the past, so she okay. was. I assume she's list. a 43 year old woman. That's common, yeah. can be common for that. So good. All right. And Thanks then for the <laughs> I would say uh, one other question here Can the panel comment on the need for K2 and where you can get it? It has a lot of attention lately. Any thoughts and suggestions on K2? Latest word from Dr. Greger is that we make all you need and you just, just really, it is not an issue. Uh, so he says, I'm looking to see other studies to corroborate that, but it was a big relief to hear that. But uh, he says the, you know, the bacteria will turn the, the, the precursors that are in the dark green leafy vegetables, another reason to have a big helping or two of dark leafy greens every day. Uh, to, so your gut bacteria can generate K1, but, the, but they continue to metabolize and, and you get a significant amount of K2 from that as well. So he's just saying in general, don't, don't worry about K2. Um, I haven't closed the chapter on it, but it was good to hear. Uh, stay tuned to this channel. We'll give you updates if we find anything new. Yeah, K2 is important for your bone health, for your arterial health, and it is. It's, it's hard to measure. I've looked at trying to figure out ways to measure it, and there's it's just not really reliable laboratory yeah. measurement at this point. So yeah, please I, stay tuned. I, I, I don't know. I do pay attention a little though, because like the microbiome converts it, but a, a lot of people with um, autoimmune diseases or IBS or gut issues, they maybe don't have that healthy microbiome yet. And if people have osteoporosis or heart disease, um, some of the higher risk people, I do supplement a little bit of it for them. Um, kind of keep an eye on it because we're not as, he as healthy as Dr. Greger, maybe as we want to be. Um, we're striving to get there, and, and but it is a, a work in progress. So like everyone else has said, stay tuned because we're also trying to get to the bottom of it. But I do tend to supplement in some, in some people for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say the final question here is um, from Kathleen. She asked about her mom having hemochromatosis. Um, and since we were on the kind of the iron talk anyway, and being hesitant about eating plant foods that are rich in iron. She started eating more plants, greens in her daily smoothie, beans in soups, and her most recent blood work shows the highest levels she's been in, had in years. And they've been recommending a phlebotomy due to the elevated numbers. She isn't giving up, but all, any advice on still getting in dark leafies and plant protein while staying away from lentils and beans? Any thoughts or suggestions on hemochromatosis in plant iron? Actually, it's safer to eat plants than animals. Right. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, 
Uh, hemochromatosis is a, is a serious condition. Uh, iron builds up in the body. We, in, under the best of circumstances, normal people can't, we don't get rid of iron very easily unless you're a menstruating female, then you, you folks uh, you lose iron every month. But us guys uh, and postmenopausal women, we eat iron and, and outside the little bit that goes out in the stool, a little bit comes out in our sweat and our skin cells, as we, they slough them. Uh, we don't uh, get rid of it very easily. And, and people with hemochromatosis barely get rid of it at all. And it can build up to high levels, as I mentioned, damage the liver, et cetera. And it can be a fatal disease. Uh, so here, dietary iron makes, an, uh, makes a difference. And like you uh, very appropriately described, eat a lot of high iron containing foods and rip shows up on the lab test. That's true. Um, so uh, a couple of things. Here's where it would be helpful uh, to find a, a plant-based dietitian uh, who can do an analysis because you need to be the low iron greens and the low iron legumes and the low iron grains. If someone needs to look at your diet and, say, and get a low iron version of that uh, going for you. And, uh, and uh, uh, Juliana Heber and others uh, are in the, uh, uh, in the field can help, uh, can help do that. Uh, but then uh, the doctors mentioned phlebotomy, not a crazy thought, so just to, uh, to drain off uh, a unit or two of blood and just get rid of the iron directly out of the bloodstream. And that's a, absolutely a, approved and legitimate maneuver for people with hemochromatosis. So if the doctor thinks it's gotten to that stage, yeah, she should definitely have that. It's just like giving a unit of blood at the blood bank. It's nothing that dramatic, but uh, that uh, regular phlebotomies may be part of her treatment there. But uh, she needs to really get serious about uh, low iron foods and, and tailor the diet to, uh, to not give her more iron overload. Yeah, absolutely. And with the, my own hemochromatosis patients, when I was in brick and mortar, certainly did. You'd hit a certain critical level and then you literally just send them to the lab and they draw the blood and they come on back down. And it's just what you have to do as part of um, management of that disease process. Um, Dr. K is very, very right. It's, it can be dangerous for the heart and the liver. And so it can cause organ failure. So it's really important that she monitor her intake, but you got to think about it. Um, plant foods are a healthier version than the animal products. So um, she'll be getting less iron absorption most likely than she would have eating more of the plant or the animal products, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, like I said, I certainly think a, a well-qualified dietitian should be able to guide her in that. And like you said, don't, don't dismiss the flaw money. It's just the way it is. Um, it's just management of disease, like taking a medication. So it's, sometimes you have to do that. So uh, yes, even on a plant-based diet. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the beauty of, um, of a plant-based diet is that the iron that's in spinach and dark leafy greens and beans, etc., uh, it's harder to absorb uh, a little bit, but the intestinal lining can decide if there's a lot of iron already in the blood, the intestinal lining can keep plant-based iron out. Not so with, with heme iron from animal muscle. Uh, that stuff leaps into the bloodstream and uh, red meat eating um, macho guys there uh, who don't realize they have hemochromatosis uh, can really give themselves an iron overload severely. So here's another advantage where red, uh, where a plant-based diet uh, gives uh, gives a leg up as far as iron balance goes. But still, she needs to be on the low iron and green uh, greens and, and other plant uh, plant foods. Okay, you guys have one more question because this one was actually emailed and she just messaged me. Okay, sorry. Uh, yesterday she was, I submitted this question, not sure how long this webinar goes. Since starting my whole food plant-based diet, my elbow psoriasis returned along uh, with both index fingers getting cracked and rough skinned. Both shins are dry, itchy around, red marks in my left leg. My weight originally fell five pounds and stopped is not budging in the last two weeks. In 15 days, my fasting glucose went from 138 down to 112, then back up to 127. She was, I ate a lot of fruit, vegetables, lentils, soups, salads, fat comes from seeds, nuts, avocados. My past thyroid tests were normal. Why am I not losing weight? And what has my glucose um, gone up high again? So I guess we'll focus on, let's try on the dry skin. And then there's lots of reasons why blood sugar go up. And honestly, that probably needs to be more of an individual appointment type basis. But can we maybe describe what they may be lacking on a dry, dry skin and a plant-based diet? Any thoughts? Um, just in general, it depends if people are following a low fat plant-based diet. So sometimes for reversing heart disease or diabetes, people would go on a real low fat diet. So we do need a little bit of fat actually. And so we do need, especially omega-3 fatty acids. So 
Um, if it's someone with diabetes or heart disease, we, we still try to sneak in maybe a little bit of flax or chia seeds, maybe, you know, something, maybe occasional little walnut, um, trying to get the higher omega-3s in. And that's something you could work with your doctor. You can monitor to see how much you were able to get in. Um, so that's one thing for, um, and if you're not on a low fat diet, then you can eat, you know, if you're a woman, I usually recommend about a quarter cup a day. And if you're a man, usually about half a cup a day um, of nuts and seeds kind of combined. So you do need that fat. So that I, rec I definitely recommend that. And the second thing we've been talking about this, I think within our group, um, different things that we like to put on our skin. And so some of those oils, like we were talking about like almond oil or coconut oil, um, some of that really actually does help in winter. And, and now we've been washing our hands so much um, so we've been using that in our house and that definitely has helped a lot with our dried cracked skin, um, using some of those oils right after we wash it in the morning, in the evening, and right after washing. So um, those are some basic tips that I have off the top of my head. And uh, someone was asking about Dr. K's masterclass. So that can be found, Dr. Clapper, on drclapper.com? Yes, if, uh, if you go to drclapper.com, uh, it'll get you onto the Teachable website and all the individual masterclass, all 12 of them are on the Teachable website. But I think the link on, on drclapper.com will get you there. Excellent. All right. And that's an excellent resource for those who are seeking more knowledge. So Dr. Pierce, thank you again for joining us today. And we're so happy to have you on our team and excited to see um, the presence you'll have in our lives and the lives of our patients. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. And have a great day. This, like I said, this will be posted on the Plant Based Telehealth YouTube page and our um, web page. You can go to plantbasedtelehealth.com, make an appointment with Dr. Pierce or either any of us as well. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you in two weeks um, on the second and fourth Thursdays of every month. We'll see you here. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Uh...